is they are the strongest uh, nutritionists for the bariatric. And uh, we are uh, doing this with, again, uh, for American Surgery Center. American Surgery Center is the only surgery center in Delaware uh, which has the uh, MBSA QIP accreditation, uh, Blue Distinction Center Plus, and Aetna um, uh, quality certification. Uh, we are a AAAC, um, AAAC um, accredited organization. Uh, so as I mentioned, we are only one in Delaware who have all these uh, certifications. And we are one of the 15 surgery centers in the nation with the MBSA QIP certification. This makes us... Sorry to interrupt, but on the Korean page, we missed the first two slides. That's okay. So that's, we can get it from the other side. So, so we are live in a couple of different channels. So they were just giving me um, the heads up that they missed a couple of the slides. So we, we will just re-upload re it. Um, so now with these certifications, uh, we also achieve the highest patient satisfaction score. And this is the fourth month in a row uh, with 100% of our patients who responded to our survey. They are uh, happy with our services and we appreciate their support. And we are extremely happy that they are, uh, they are satisfied with our services. Uh, today, we are gonna discuss uh, a topic that we already covered last week. So what we are gonna do this year, as I mentioned earlier this year, uh, we are gonna repeat our uh, different sessions again. Uh, just so that we can actually maybe say it in a different way. Maybe different people can understand, uh, more people can understand in a different way. So we are gonna do that uh, on the types of bariatric surgery and why someone would be getting one versus the other surgery. So uh, Dr. Irga is gonna educate us today. Uh, Dr. Irga, would you like to start with the overall um, uh, types of surgeries? Absolutely. So uh, essentially, a bariatric surgery or weight loss surgery is indicated when a person reaches a certain weight. And we know that once that weight has been reached, the person has very, very little chance of losing weight without any substantial help. Um, generally, we talk about the need for weight loss surgery when a person's weight is about 100 pounds higher than their healthy or ideal body weight. So if a person's healthy weight is supposed to be 150 pounds, and now they weigh 250 pounds, we say that bariatric surgery should be considered. There are certain situations in which even a lower weight than that could make a person a candidate for weight loss surgery. But generally, that excess weight which corresponds to a body mass index of 40. Body mass index is a calculated number that is derived by putting the height and the weight of the person together. And when we say, we say that when the body mass index is 40 or above, which corresponds to an excess weight of 100 pounds or higher, then we say bariatric surgery or weight loss surgery should be looked at as a possible uh, option for making that person healthier. Now, all of the procedures that we undertake when we do bariatric surgery involve some type of change in the digestive tract, right? So for instance, when we do uh, a lap band surgery, which is at the bottom left of this screen, then we're placing a device around the upper portion of the uh, stomach to uh, help that person control the flow of food into the stomach. When we do gastric bypass, which is at the top right side uh, in this picture, we are actually cutting the stomach and then rerouting the intestine. It's a fairly complex procedure that we also do. Another procedure that is done very, very commonly is the sleeve gastrectomy, which is at the top left of this picture. And in that situation, our goal is actually to reduce the volume of the stomach surgically by removing a good portion, what we call the greater curvature of the stomach, which is the most stretching portion of the stomach completely out and then leave that person with a banana shaped, a much, much smaller pipe-like stomach. All these procedures actually in our uh, program, we do laparoscopically with very small incisions. In fact, all these procedures uh, we do in our surgery center 
as an outpatient basis in most cases. Now, the, the picture you see at the bottom right is the duodenal switch, which is uh, uh, another type of weight loss surgery, which is done less commonly, but it is even more radical compared to the gastric bypass because of the extent in which the small intestine is rerouted. That's another procedure that is also offered in our center. In general, these are the options available. Which procedure may be best for a particular individual is obviously uh, discussed when a person comes for an individual consultation where we are able to explore the medical history, the surgical history, the comfort level, the expected uh, outcome for that particular uh, individual. Needless to say that by far the most common procedure that we currently perform is the sleeve gastrectomy, which is the, the one depicted in the top right. And that procedure seems to offer the best uh, compromise in terms of giving really, really a strong procedure with the least impact in terms of changes on the digestive tract. Having said that, we do offer also much less invasive procedure like the gastric balloon, uh, whereby we actually introduce a balloon into the stomach and leave it there for about six months to give that person an ability to reduce the amount of food that they can put in their stomach, to create a stretching of the stomach on a continuous basis to mimic fullness, and also to delay something called gastric emptying. That procedure is uh, completely non-invasive because we, are, we would do it without making any incisions in the skin. It's done endoscopically, which means we introduce that balloon through the mouth of the person when the person is asleep. And it's a procedure really that is appropriate only for people who are looking to lose a modest amount of weight. In fact, it's indicated for people with a body mass index between 30 to 40, which would mean class one or class two obesity. Uh, Kamal, uh, are we going to spend time talking about a specific procedure today? Do you want me to expand more on this, uh, 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 on the balloon today? And then we can expand on the other procedures on other on uh, future sessions. So what I wanted to do, a couple of questions, Dr. Ergal. So uh, if we can cover the um, gastric sleeve and the bypass, uh, just so that um, the difference between the two is pretty clear. We have done this in different videos, but <clears throat> today um, I just want to make sure that when, uh, that's why I put the pictures a little bit bigger on these. So when patients are looking at them, uh, they can kind of see the complexity of these procedures. Uh, now, uh, like I have one specific question for you, right? Sure. When we are looking at here, so there is no uh, detachment here, right? So this is just staying the same. So we are yes. taking the part of the uh, stomach. So then this uh, kind of like orangish, um, uh, which actually I have seen this. We send this for biopsy, right? Um, uh, we take so, this, this thing is taken out for the no, gas. No, no. So, so uh, let, let, let me correct that one. So the stomach that used to be up here, obviously on the, is removed, but the organ that you see behind, that's actually the pancreas that is obviously left behind. See, like, okay. So that's, I thought it was the one that we were taking, like when we were, <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we are taking a portion of the stomach. So, the, 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 the stomach, which is obviously looks like a watermelon, you know, in its original shape, is partitioned so that now it looks more like a banana, as you can see uh, on the left uh, uh, upper portion of the, of, the, yeah. of the screen. Yes, that is so the stomach. This, so this is the stitches, right? That dot at the shape line. That's where yeah. the stomach has been cut yeah. and then sealed, essentially. So the final picture of the stomach is the one that looks like a banana, essentially. So that is the sleeve gastrectomy. And uh, uh, we actually, our practice is the first uh, uh, practice to perform the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy in the state of uh, Delaware. And we have been performing this for many years now. We have great experience with the sleeve gastrectomy. As I said, it's by far the most common procedure that we perform. And I believe also our practice is the first one to institute a completely outpatient uh, setting for the sleeve gastrectomy, not only in our state, but in our tri-state area, uh, Kamal. In fact, uh, um, there are only very few places in the country where people go home the same day after a sleeve gastrectomy. 
And uh, we have been able to institute a protocol really that allows people to have so little in terms of symptoms of nausea or uh, pain that they are able to go and sleep in their own bed essentially uh, with excellent safety uh, parameters. So the sleep gastrectomy works essentially because a large portion of the stomach, particularly the stretching portion of the stomach is removed. So the person will have uh, very little room for them to overeat. There is not really much room. In fact, the portion of the stomach that is left behind is fairly um, uh, non-compliant. It means that doesn't stretch very easily. It's pretty tight. So when people eat, they will feel full very quickly. And then on top of that, the other important point, Kamal, like we've talked in the past, is the portion of the stomach that we remove happens to be that portion of the stomach that harbors the signals of hunger as well. And so it's not uncommon for many of our patients to say that they don't feel hungry at all after surgery and they have to remind themselves to it. That's actually another very a good picture for us to be able to demonstrate exactly what it is uh, that we do with this procedure. Uh, uh, exactly. So that is the sleeve gastrectomy. Essentially, we are removing a good portion of the stomach, yeah, as you're showing on this uh, slide here, uh, and nothing else. The intestine is left intact. We do not do any changes in the intestine, essentially, right? Now, going on to the gastric bypass, which is depicted on the uh, right side, then come on, we uh, essentially are partitioning the stomach, we make the stomach a lot smaller, right? At the top, they said there is a very small stomach that we call pouch, but then uh, we reroute the intestine. We bring the intestine from below and we attach it with that portion of the stomach so that now food comes from the food pipe, enters the little stomach, and then immediately it goes into the intestine. So the major, major difference with the sleeve gastrectomy is this rerouting of the intestine. Right? Now, there are implications going forward in the future as to what this means for the patient. Once you've rerouted the intestine, essentially you are interfering with the ability of the intestine to absorb vital nutrients like vitamins. So vitamin insufficiency is a potential uh, implication of the gastric bypass. Once you've rerouted the intestine, the potential for the intestine to twist and cause blockage is there. And also once you reconnect the intestine with the stomach, you create a situation where ulcer formation can happen. So there are certain situations where we say the gastric bypass is better than the sleeve gastrectomy. For instance, if a person has severe, severe reflux or even damage to the food pipe as a consequence of reflux, then we say maybe the gastric bypass is better as opposed to the sleeve gastrectomy. But by far the vast majority of people who need to lose substantial weight loss will actually lose similar amounts just with the sleep gastrectomy. There is no need to go to the gastric bypass, but there are certain situations where the gastric bypass is better indicated compared to the sleep gastrectomy. The good thing, Kamal, is that our practice is extremely experienced with both procedures. In fact, uh, when Dr. Wynne and I started bariatric surgery and then a few days, years later, we were joined by Dr. Peters, the vast majority of procedures we were doing were gastric bypasses. In fact, we introduced the laparoscopic approach to gastric bypass in Delaware ourselves. Our practice introduced that and established it as a firm uh, procedure. So we have extremely large experience with gastric bypass as well, but with the availability of the sleeve gastrectomy about 10 years ago, we were able to give the same kind of results with a less impactful procedure, essentially with the sleeve gastrectomy. That's why you see uh, many of our patients come out choosing the sleeve gastrectomy uh, because they obviously do not want the implication of rerouting of the intestine. But when it is necessary, obviously we are uh, fairly well positioned to perform the gastric bypass as well. So between the gastric sleeve and gastric bypass, we do about like 80% of the procedures almost gastric sleeve. And on the gastric bypass, um, it's about 20% uh, at the surgery center. And maybe at the surgery center, it's even maybe a little bit uh, smaller than that number, uh, right, Dr. Gass? So yeah. one of the, um, uh, I think from the non-surgeon standpoint, uh, so I just wanna make sure that some of my questions are, uh, yes, it is kind of designed from the patient side so that I can just act uh, like if I don't know much about it. So now um, 
one of the uh, differences that I see is for the bypass, we have to do, uh, the BMI has to be a lot lower for us to be able to operate on those patients, especially at the surgery center. Uh, do you, uh, can you elaborate that a little bit? Sure, absolutely. So clearly, when we come to the indications for either procedure, it is very important to understand that both procedures require a body mass index of 40 or above, but sometimes, as you know, even a body mass index of 35 can allow a person to be a candidate for either procedures, gastric bypass or gastric sleep, if they already have developed certain medical conditions that we call comorbidities like diabetes, high blood pressure, or sleep apnea. So that would be the basic, right? Now, when we perform these procedures at the surgery center, we have decided that for a person to be a candidate for the sleep gastrectomy at the surgery center, their body mass index cannot be higher than 55 for a male or cannot be higher than 60 for female. That is for the sleeve gastrectomy. For the gastric bypass, the requirement for body mass index are even lower than that. In fact, we say for a man, it should not be more than 45. And for a woman, it should not be more than 50. And the reason we did that is because at the surgery center, we're performing a procedure on a completely outpatient basis. And because of the complexity of gastric bypass, the need for the weight to be on the lower side is clear. Now, does this mean we don't offer this surgery to patients with a body mass index uh, you know, greater than that? Not at all. Remember, one of the things that happen is as we are preparing patients for surgery, and you know very well because you chair our uh, uh, bariatric coordinator meetings every day and you see these patients all the time, is that it takes some time for a patient to be ready for bariatric surgery. And in that process, it's not uncommon for some patients who start from a higher body mass index to actually come down for them to qualify for having surgery at the surgery center. Clearly for patients who are on a very high body mass index, obviously we will do them in an inpatient setting uh, rather than in the surgery center. So Dr. Gao, we have done many uh, uh, first in um, CREAS, under CREAS and surgery center. So we were the first uh, bariatric practice in Delaware, first on the sleeve, first on but then you and I, uh, we actually started the balloon uh, program uh, at the surgery center. So the balloon was kind of different than what we knew prior to the uh, other surgeries. Um, so it's not a surgery, there is no um, incision. So it's pretty much like an endoscopy. So I do wanna spend a little bit of time on the balloon uh, just so that we can, we were also the first one uh, and we are still the only one I believe not only in Delaware, but probably in the tri-state area. So can we actually discuss the balloon and uh, who can actually benefit from the balloon and uh, what's uh, available for those patients? Absolutely. So we're looking at the uh, indications for the balloon would be a person with a body mass index between 30 to 40, essentially. So generally it's for people who are looking to lose on average 25 pounds that would be the expected average, although people have lost up to 45, 50 pounds, even with the balloon, right? So as you are showing in your picture, I do have actually one uh, sample of the balloon here in, in my hand. That is the actual balloon that is inserted in the stomach. I'm but it's not inserted. Stop sharing so then they can see the full picture, go ahead. Yeah, so that is actually the actual uh, balloon, the Orbera balloon. So it's a good size and it has some weight and it enters the stomach deflated, but once it's in, in the stomach with the endoscope, we are able to inflate it. And so to demonstrate this a little bit more, I actually have this little desk model as well. So you were ready to present for this, so we didn't, I, I we was didn't, indeed. <laughs> so we didn't think about it. So, okay, so, good. So, so that is a model of the stomach. That would be the food pipe, and that is the intestine, and that is the body of the stomach. And this orange uh, balloon inside it would be the balloon. So we insert the balloon through the mouth into the food pipe when the person is asleep, just like a normal endoscopy. And then once we are inside, we are able to inflate it, and we inflate it to anywhere between 400 to 700 ml essentially. And the balloon then sits within the stomach and it moves freely within the stomach, but it stretches the stomach. It creates a sensation of fullness so the person is not hungry very frequently. 
Now, this is a totally non-invasive procedure in that we don't go through the skin. There is no wounds, there is no incisions, but also it's important to understand that it's a foreign body inside the stomach. So there is a time limit as to how long we can leave it inside, right, uh, Kamal? And that time limit is actually six months. But our program, as you know, offers a 12 months program, which mm -hmm. means that the person will be seeing a nutritionist and the bariatric doctors, uh, surgeons, monthly for the six months in which the balloon is inside, but also for another six months afterwards to make sure that the weight that was lost during the balloon actually stays off as the person goes forward without the balloon. Now, it's a non-invasive procedure, but also it means that the potential risks are much less compared to the other surgeries. But it doesn't mean there are not risks with this either. Like any procedures, there could be risks, whether it's heartburn, nausea, vomiting, or even ulcers. And very, very rarely bowel blockage can happen with the balloon as well. But these things are not very common. And we do many things in uh, a proactive manner to prevent many of the uh, potential uh, complications. So the balloon is one of the options that is there for people who are looking to lose uh, 25 pounds, 30 pounds, 35 pounds. Uh, but it is a non-invasive procedure and it's obviously completely reversible because we put the balloon in and when we take it out, the anatomy remains the same. Essentially. I remember one of the first patients we have done uh, this was Dr. Maida Melendez. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm able, I'm able to share the name because she did actually, uh, she was part of the uh, promotional event. So, uh, and she did lose, I, I, I believe she lost about almost 40 or 45 pounds. So this can stay up to like six months, right Dr. Ga? Absolutely, the balloon can stay up to six months and then after that it's removed. And, um, and then essentially, you know, all these are different methods essentially because we recognized Although you and I deal mainly with people who need to lose 100 pounds or more, we recognize that there are many, many people who are struggling to lose that extra 25, that extra 30 pounds. And they've done different methods, different diets, and they have not been successful. So this is not surgery as such that we don't make uh, change, uh, you know, changes in the digestive tract that are irreversible but we offer a procedure that can give them that extra help they need for them to lose that 25, 30, 40, 45 pounds that they need to lose to be at a healthy weight. So, you know, Dr. Riga, I see the balloon uh, in a way that it's almost, um, sometimes we need that uh, kind of like startup to see the results. Uh, in many patients who are uh, dealing with obesity, they can't really see the quick results uh, without making uh, big changes in their day-to-day uh, -day life. So I think balloon would be, in many cases, it would be the least risky uh, kind of step up uh, procedure for them. Um, absolutely, 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 it would be. Yeah, it would be because uh, it's done through endoscopy. And as you know, endoscopy is something we do very commonly to look for uh, problems that cause indigestion and other things. It's a very quick procedure. So the procedure itself, its magnitude is, uh, uh, relatively low compared to the other procedures that we offer, but the benefits are there, particularly, as I said, for people who've tried different methods and that extra 25, 30 pounds has been so, so difficult for them to get rid of. So, so it's an option, essentially. If someone starts, uh, I mean, if someone uh, gets the balloon on, let's say on a Monday, um, so the, how long would that would they, would they need to spend uh, time at the surgery center? So at the surgery center, essentially, they would be discharged within a few hours. They just have to, particularly in the early hours and then the, even up to 24, 48 hours, people, because there is this sudden distension of the stomach, they can feel as if they've had two Thanksgiving dinners at once. So they, they may not feel good. And we give them many medications to mitigate that but then that dissipates over time and they feel you know, uh, comfortable without the nausea, but clearly they, you know, their ability to eat a big meal is reduced, the hunger level is lower. And then because gastric emptying is also discouraged with the presence of the balloon, 
their chances of uh, really not uh, um, consuming, you know, uh, a lot of calories are good, and then the, the weight loss will occur. It is not a magic answer, just like any of the procedures we do. It does require commitment. None of our procedures, as you come out, as you know, and we see this all the time, are magic answers. Uh, because obesity is uh, entrenched in the biology of the person and we're not taking that biology away, but we're providing people a powerful tool for them to be able to really see the weight dropping off. And all these are options that we have available in our Honestly, Dr. Gale, what I see with the uh, process with so many patients that we go through, uh, like uh, this month will be about 35 cases, next month more than 40. Uh, to get to those numbers, we process um, almost like 120 patients on a weekly basis. Okay. And these numbers are pretty high. And one of the reasons, uh, one of the, um, uh, maybe like my personal opinion in this, that what I see is a lot of excuses that we find for mm -hmm. patients to stop the process. Mm -hmm. So, and every time I see, I actually take a note now, like that I can actually maybe call and then reach out to the patient personally to see if there's something that, we can uh, actually uh, do from our side to maybe educate them a little bit more, counsel them. And there are so many different things that happens in our lives. And in some Absolutely. cases we are not, um, uh, we are not ready, but we are actually, we should have been ready for so long. And instead of delaying the process or instead of uh, interrupting the process, the best would be uh, getting the team, uh, getting into our team, and then make let let our team to do the work and work with you. Uh, even for today's um, uh, discussion, uh, it's it's a repeat discussion. You can find the same information in so many different places, but we want to be available to the patients so that they can actually they feel like they are not alone, and they Absolutely. also know that there are so many other people are going through the challenges. Now, again, from my uh, personal um, uh, experience, what I see is every time we delay the process, we see weight gain. There, there are some miracles. Uh, in fact, th today we had one patient who was able to lose weight with the nutritionist's help. And we wanted to make sure that this was, this was uh, acknowledged and uh, it was great from the nutritionist side and from our side. So it's not like we are trying to force people to surgery, but we just want to make sure that they have the most um, support that they need available. Uh, the only, again, the only thing is, as you delay the process, you are making the trouble bigger. So uh, we have a team of people, not only uh, in the practice, but also uh, just like this event, we are here. Uh, so uh, just to kind of streamline our, uh, uh, our different uh, live sessions, what we have done. Uh, I'm going to share this one again with you guys. Um, our uh, 3 p.m. Wednesday with Dr. Ergao and myself will be on a weekly basis. And the second and fourth uh, Tuesday of each month for uh, 6 p.m. for uh, Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Wynn uh, and the other surgeons through St. Francis and CREAS program. And then we have our bariatric support group uh, first Tuesday of each month. And uh, from the United Medical ACO, we have our uh, Friday noon updates for, uh, this is more like right now COVID uh, and COVID-19 uh, vaccine related uh, items that we go through. And um, all of these events are gonna be in a different specific playlist. So uh, try to catch these, uh, I'm hoping that uh, people are benefiting from this. And tonight we have an event with our, um, from our nutritionist. This is for the patient with diabetes, uh, but feel free to uh, catch us on this event as well. It's gonna be at 7 p.m. It's with uh, Amy, uh, Donna, and myself will be there. Um, so now, Dr. Nga, before we close uh, the session, uh, anything you would like to add Yes, absolutely. So I think, uh, Kamal, uh, as you correctly say, this is it's very important for us to have these conversations. And although we are going over certain things that we've mentioned in the past, 
uh, we are uh, bringing perhaps a different angle, a different uh, view on it that may benefit our patients. I actually encourage our patients to participate in these uh, events if they have time or to watch the recorded ones. And the ones that come up to me with feedback, they're actually very happy they've done. So they say they've you know, picked up something that they may not have thought of. So I think uh, this is good. We should continue with it. Um, uh, our practice is committing to educating not only our patients and prospective patients, but our community on uh, what we are doing to combat this uh, very serious disease, which is obesity. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Riga, thank you for joining us. And... Uh... We'll see you again next week. Uh, and Thank you. Thank you. For so us and then just try to catch us on different events. And if not, we'll see you next week. Thank you.